Well, good day YouTubers. And yes, the uh, sun is out occasionally. Now uh, the sky is blue. Well, sort of. The temperature has risen and the wind has dropped, which means it's finally time to talk about the Harley Shovelhead, fire up the old beast and take her for a spin. Firstly, I want to say a big thank you to all of you out there for your fantastic comments on the previous video. Uh, not only is it reassuring to know that there's so many out there that uh, care and wonder how I'm doing, which is, uh, it's, yeah, it's heartwarming. And it's, it's nice to know you're not alone. Um, but yeah, so let's uh, get on with the bike, eh? This is a 1978 Harley Davidson FXE 1200 Superglide but uh, the knowledgeable amongst you will notice straight away that it's not exactly standard for starters the standard FXE 1200 features an instrument panel in the center of the tank now this tank appears to be standard shape and size and it has the two filler caps even though one of them's a blank but the center section where the instrument panel would fit has been very very skillfully filled in and welded and smoothed and painted and it is absolutely impossible to tell that there were instruments there at some point or another looking at the front forks even though they're steeper than standard uh, the frame hasn't actually been what's known as cut and shut. The frame in fact is completely stuck. The increased angle of the forks is taken care of by these very, very uh, nicely made, quite clever, offset top and bottom yokes. And you can clearly see in this shot the difference in angle between the forks and the frame headstock. And of course the exhaust system as you'd expect on a custom Harley, isn't standard. It's this rather fetching two into one exhaust and muffler system. The engine is a 1200 cc or 74 cubic inch engine and is, as far as I'm aware, completely stock. The bike is fitted with an SNS Super E carburetor and air cleaner. Braking at the front is taken care of by these non standard and quite large cast iron drilled brake discs though the brake calipers themselves and the pads are standard and of course there's the absolutely necessary Goodridge stainless steel braided brake hoses at the front is a 19 inch alloy wheel with stainless spokes and a mark II Avon Speedmaster tire despite its vintage appearance a completely modern tire with modern construction techniques and at the rear we have a 16 inch alloy wheel with stainless spokes and a Mark II Avon mileage tyre. Once again, traditional appearance, modern construction. Though this doesn't help the cornering ability, on a few occasions the rear end has stepped out slightly. Nothing too trouser numbing, but alarming all the same. The gearbox has four speeds and is, um, well it changes gears. It enables you to go quicker or slower but it's nothing like the gearboxes on modern motorbikes I could liken it to something fitted to a tractor very agricultural the rear suspension are these pair of non-standard progressive units and progressive is the name of the manufacturer the rear brake disc and caliper are both standard and in fact has more biting power than the front brakes combined. And finally, the other major non-standard component is the seat. It's a Lapera solo unit with the optional bolt-on rear pillion pad. Despite appearances, the rider's seat is actually extremely comfortable. And of course, comparing the bike to the standard model, the whole machine has been lowered by means of the shorter shock absorbers at the rear and the lowered forks at the front. 
Now before I fire her up, I'm just going to go through the various uh, problems that I found with this bike, all of which reared their ugly head on the day I took delivery and my very first ride on this bike. <coughs> it's uh, quite extensive. That's extensive, not expensive. Even though it was expensive, but yeah, there you go. I digress. Firstly, when I put some fuel in the bike, the filler cap was leaking. Uh, it turns out that the seals on these caps aren't the best, and I naturally filled the tank up to the neck while the bike was leaning over at the pump. And then, when I sat the bike upright, fuel poured out from under the cap and went onto the hot exhaust and it was a miracle that it didn't catch light so so now every time I put fuel in I keep it way below the bottom of the filler neck almost instantly the bike developed a massive misfire which I eventually traced to the spark plugs which were so warm they could quite easily have been the originals. The battery died about 10 miles from Garstang and leaving me stranded. The drive chain had been adjusted so tightly you could have played Mike Oldfield's tubular bells on it. The clutch was slipping because the selling dealer who apparently has 25 years of selling and trading quality motorcycles, had failed to realize that the primary chain case doesn't contain any oil. The primary drivetrain is fed by a drip feed system, just a tiny amount of oil, a few drops every minute. So the dealer, in his infinite wisdom, filled the chain case about halfway with engine oil which caused the dry clutch to slip. Also because of this, because there shouldn't be engine oil in the primary chain case, as I was riding along, hot engine oil began spewing out from around the starter solenoid, running across the top of the chain case and all over the road. Another contributing factor to the misfire and the fact that the engine ran like a pig uh, was that the air filter was completely clogged, totally black and choked. The crankshaft primary oil seal was completely worn and engine lubricating oil, instead of travelling through the engine and returning to the oil tank, was slowly seeping out of the seal and into the primary chain case. So of course, not happy with this, I decided to put the bike straight into the storage unit and spent a week repairing all the various problems. I then refitted all the components and discovered that the engine and gearbox had been fitted out of alignment. Whoever had fiddled with the bike previously hadn't gone through the correct sequence of refitting the primary chain case to the engine and gearbox, which are two separate items. It pulled it out of shape. Luckily, no permanent damage was done and I refitted everything in the correct order, and it's now fine. And with the introduction out of the way, it's now time to fire up the beast. And I'm gonna swap over my microphones so that you can all appreciate the full ambience of a bare bones, classic designed, big ball V-twin. Though the bike does have an electric start as well as a kick start, and is in fact one of the last Harleys to be fitted with both as standard. It would be criminal if I didn't at least try to kick it over. Now I've uh, I've tried on a few occasions and 50% of the time it's worked. Um, but as a lot of you will know, many old bikes uh, are very finicky. They have their own particular way of doing things. Um, so here goes. Firstly, I'm going to run some fuel through by kicking the engine over with the ignition off um, just to prime the cylinders and then we'll go for it. And 
And then ignition on. Bit of choke. As I say, I still haven't got the hang of it because I've hardly had a chance to ride it. So, electric start. Fit. After all, they fitted it for a reason. This tick over's a bit low and it doesn't do the engine a lot of good to run it low but uh, as is all the rage on YouTube uh, people like to get their tick overs as low as possible on a shovel head but uh, I shall now put the tick over back up so I don't want to starve the top end of oil now do I? an instant smile. Lots of vibration. Yeah, there's lots of things about this bike. I don't know what the camera on the front's doing. This one here. I imagine it's uh, vibrating a bit. Oh. <laughs> 
Unreal. Oh, e oh, the roads. Oh, oh. And they made all the more terrible by the suspension. Well, there is of it at least. Now, a viewer suggested on the last video that I should hardtail the bike. That's it. Remove the rear end of the suspension and replace it with a tubular welded frame extension. And the wheel bolts directly to that. As I say, that's now as hardtailing or a rigid rear end. Somehow I don't think that would be a good idea. Be okay in a 20 mile long straight road in Arizona where the tarmac's like a snooker table. Whoa, but not on the pot old. Oh, ow. Oh, big old. Not on the pot old tarmac of. Good old light here. Right, just for legal reasons, I have to say that uh, the purpose of this journey is to access an outdoors area known as Glass and Dock for the purposes of exercise. With that out of the way, let's get back to the ride. As I was saying, you get a lot of vibration. You feel every single combustion cycle through your hands, feet, Backside, oh, at your back, but it never gets too painful. up with a problem with 
well gut ache caused by or intestines getting all compressed. And another uh, issue I've had before. Let's go past this car. And over this jump. Oh yeah. Yeah another issue I've had on this bike on occasion is cramp in my legs. Just at the top of your thighs you have to pull over and get off the bike as quick as you can. Get the blood flowing again. Today, probably because I was sure not to have any breakfast, I feel absolutely perfect. If anyone in Britain thinks it's a good idea to buy a hardtail bobber or chopper, think again. Unless you have an incredibly strong back like Jeff Capes, you'll just end up snapped in half. So you're probably thinking, well if it's noisy it vibrates, it's uncomfortable on occasions. You can play havoc with your back. Hey, why do I like riding it? Why, when the feathers dry, do I choose to ride this and not something a lot more accomplished, like the Kawasaki Nomad? And it's precisely because Kawasaki is finely engineered, doesn't put the foot wrong, it's unerringly reliable, and supremely comfortable, simple and it does give that slight impression that it could possibly pack up any second but well, it's not quite that bad keeps you on your toes it's the difference between riding club pony or a stallion that uh, hasn't had his nuptials for uh, several months together that you've actually achieved something and you've experienced something singularly unique I mean, there are many custom Harleys but there's only one like this that's the whole idea of custom has your unique stamp and personality on it. The way this engine pulls is I'm in fourth gear doing about 40 and then I just wind the throttle up and you get going. There's the, the way it looks, the way it sounds, the 
admiring glances of pedestrians. It's what they call a head turner. But I didn't buy it for other people's benefit. I bought it for mine. An alcoholic, a special brew, a drug addict has heroin. Well, I have a Harley shovel head. It's a very powerful and effective drug. Whoa. Politically correct. Though it's surprisingly uh, fuel efficient. I've no doubt that in the future, next eight years or so, at least by 2030, machines like this be outlawed and consigned to a museum. That will be quite a sad day. Well, that was a nice walk, and it would be criminal not to enjoy a nice cup of tea from the lock keeper's rest here at Glass and Dock. Oh, wow. It doesn't take a lot to make me happy.
Just give me a narrow boat and a canal to sail by. Or a thumping Harley. Mm. A delicious cup of tea and a double cheeseburger at the end of it.